Okay, right. Thank you uh, very much for joining us here. Welcome to this first and final issue briefing of today. Um, the subject of this one kind of brings us back to where we started. We've run a, a program throughout this week, and it's, I'm honoured to have some of, some of our speakers from previous sessions in the audience today. We've run through a gamut of, of dystopian visions, economic catastrophe, environmental collapse, uh, the risk of geopolitical conflict. We really haven't been trying to cheer you up with these <laughs> sessions. Um, so this one's going to be, you know, hopefully a, a, a diversion from this course, and we're going to be talking about the prospects, we hope, for market capitalism to reform society and build inclusive, just um, civilizations. Um, it's an ambitious brief, and we only have half an hour. So it's not about me. It's about talking dialogue between the three speakers here, and ideally as much interchange with yourselves as possible. So I encourage questions um, whenever you feel one coming into your head. Stick your hand up. We'll try to work as many in as possible. I encourage as much debate and disagreement amongst my panel and amongst yourselves as we can possibly have. And I, hopefully, ideally, we'll have a little bit of fun too. So I want to start with um, introducing my first uh, guest here, Cardinal Peter Turkson, Prefect for Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development in the Vatican City. It's similar to a portfolio for international development. Your Eminence, you started the meeting back on Monday, all those days ago, with quite a strong message to the participants here. And amongst other things, you called for uh, the, you know, the participants and the people at this meeting to assist in building inclusive, just, and supportive societies capable of restoring dignity to those who live with great uncertainty. What is your view on the prospects for markets to deliver this? And how has your view changed or been shaped by the course of this meeting? Thank you. Uh, the possibility of markets helping to deliver this, of course, depends on those who operate the markets. Uh, the markets themselves are just a tool, institutional tool, if you want, and a lot depends on those who use this tool. So effectively, the, 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 the address or the message is an invitation for those who operate and use the markets to recognize that they belong to a human family, which, whose relationships are interdependent and therefore interrelated. And it's an appeal to this interrelatedness, interconnectedness of all elements of society to recognize also the need to fashion an inclusive system which helps lift everybody out of poverty and which helps realize basically what you know, the world, family of nations gather in the UN to talk about the SDGs. Uh, Ban Ki-moon talking about this said, this is a narrative of dignity for everybody, leaving nobody behind. And if we're going to leave nobody behind, it's because we want to try to be inclusive. And if we want to try to be inclusive, then it's to make the institutions which we use, like in this case markets, to respond to this sense of inclusiveness of the human family because we are basically interconnected and interrelated. Uh, you remember, I, I believe it was a, what, two or three years ago you were last at this meeting, you delivered a, a message. And this is subtly, yeah. subtly stronger. Is that a signal that perhaps the message isn't getting no, through? No, or no. Do, you think, <laughs> do you think mindsets are being changed? We no, talk no. a lot here about shifting mindsets. It never happens as fast as one would like. No, the last, the last time we were here, 2014, uh, with a message given, that was an attempt to encourage the world of business. That's when the message referred to the business people, business as a noble vocation, and invited people, therefore, in this business to learn to reach out to the very many, to use their proven talents to help the very many who still need to be helped and lifted out. So that was the message that was said. In that sense, this repeats the same message, just that it identifies this invitation to help lift up people as the appeal to inclusiveness. And what have your conversations been like this week? <laughs> now, uh, we, 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 we've engaged in several, you know, several, several, several conversations, several people, uh, and talking from all kinds of interests, uh, points of view. The last one last night was religious. I've seen that, you know, talking about, you know, inner peace and how the system and everything that we celebrate in Norway helps people to, you know, build inner peace. But essentially, I think participating always in this, at the, you know, because Professor Schwab is very much convinced that there is something that ethics and virtue can contribute to the business of Davos. And, and it's, 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 it's something that probably needs to be taken on board seriously. <coughs> virtue in business does pay. And, and our presence over here is to help people recognize that. It's not one, a business doesn't lose when it tries to get virtuous. Business has all to gain when it tries to get virtuous and to respond to some of these ethical uh, demands. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not to make the business disadvantaged in any way, 
but is to help it properly gain and gain on its response to society. Twenty years ago, the Catholic Church for the first time wrote a document and recognized people's right to capital. Mm -hmm. It did that because it's a people have right to capital because with capital then they decide freely to exercise responsibility towards the many others in society who need to be helped. So the right to capital and the right to exercise in any of this then is an invitation to freely exercise responsibility towards the others. And that basically is how we fashion inclusiveness or inclusion in this regard. Emmons, thank you. Uh, you're off the hook for the time being. We'll come back to these issues, I'm sure. But let's move on to John McDonnell, uh, the right honourable John McDonnell, Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer of the United Kingdom. Honoured to have you here. Your first visit, I believe, to our, our annual meeting. Uh, and it's a very timely one. Um, in, in, uh, there are, let's say, acknowledge the members of the media from the UK here as well. Um, interesting debate at a time when the global economy is humming along and there's synchronized growth across most regions um, and yet you have institutions like the World Economic Forum and the IMF on Monday just saying that growth alone isn't enough and you have to have good quality growth that supports inclusivity but how do you balance the financial benefits of trade and investment with those needs to protect and build protect people and build strong societies it's interesting I've only been here for 24 hours <laughs> and there's been this discussion about global growth returning it isn't in the UK, we're for, we've, our, our growth has been downgraded by the IMF. But there's almost a sense of euphoria, it is extraordinary, and I think there's a sense of complacency. So, one of the most important speeches in recent years is by the Pope at the European Parliament, and there was a sense yeah, of frustration yeah. in that speech, <laughs> that, lesson, that messages had been given, but they hadn't been listened to. <laughs> and out there, I think, beyond the Davos compound, I think many people... Well, we saw it in the Oxfam report, feel the markets have been rigged against them, not for them. And it's interesting, I, I just come with a message, really, of, uh, I, just a warning. When people are in the depths of a recession, they focus on survival. When they're told we're coming out of that recession, growth is returning, and they don't feel they're participating in the benefits of that growth, that's when people become really alienated and angry. And I just warn the sort of Davos establishment, there's an anger building out there that you need to recognise and deal with it. People have had 10 years of austerity. Since the bank, banking crash, 2007, 2008, wages have been frozen or been cut back. Many people have worked their way out of the slump, working hard, long hours for less pay, but paid their taxes, and then they look and they get evidence from the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers, that the super-rich and, co and corporations are avoiding their taxes on an industrial scale. That breeds alienation. No wonder people no longer trust the system. They see it as a contract and it is rigged. So what we're saying, and what many of us are saying now, that just has to be a, a radical new agenda, where, it's exactly as the Cardinal said, where people share in the growth, share in the wealth, share in the benefits as the economic cycle turns. And it's simple. I'll, I'll run through it very, very quickly. One, it means basically pay a decent wage, a real living wage. It means allowing people to share in the profits when a company makes those profits. It means also have, giving people a stake in their company, an ownership of their company, and promoting concepts like cooperation as well. Secondly, I think it is about saying people want their voice heard. They want to be able to have trade unions recognize, properly recognised and representing them, but they also want, I think, reform of governance, workers on boards, workers who involve themselves in determining the remuneration. <coughs> and also, I think, the final bit is really is a fair taxation system. I just say to the corporations and the super-rich, pay your taxes. The at the moment, um, there's a lack of confidence in the tax system being fair because of the exposures that have gone on. So I think there's a moral duty on those who earn more and the corporations who profit is actually say, we're going to reject tax avoidance. We're going to reject it as a concept. Tell their auditors and accountants, maximise our tax rather than minimise it. And for the accountancy firms now, I think we almost need like a new Hippocratic O for them, where they yeah. sign up to being committed to tackling tax avoidance themselves rather than coming up with all these bizarre schemes to enable that to happen and then laundering money into tax havens. There needs to be transparency. We should publish 
we should publish our income tax returns. I do it, Jeremy Corbyn does. I'm saying to anyone in government who's involved in decisions around taxation, publish your income tax returns. I think wealthy people should do it as well. I think the corporations should. Just one final point as well, and it's one that's been raised at Davos in the past, and it's never really gone further. There's a view that, you know, for some time now, a number of us have been campaigning for a Robin Hood tax, whereby there's an extension of the taxation, almost like stamp duty on on trading, which would bring in funds that could then help us meet our development goals. Every time there's been an attempt at that on a global basis, it's floundered in some form. So it needs organizations to lobby their governments and governments to come forward with examples of them doing it. And that's what we've said in terms of the Labour Party. We will introduce a Robin Hood tax and we'll use it to fund public services and also maintain our commitment to our development goals as well. I think in that way, there might be a potential for changing the attitude of those millions and billions of people that we saw in the Oxfam report who are becoming increasingly angry that they're not being treated fairly by the system and the system is rigged against them. John, we're going to have, have questions afterwards. I first want to bring in Catherine Garrett-Cox. Catherine, you're a, a young global leader of the forums community. You're also Chief Executive Officer of Golf International Bank. You're a successful CEO. And you've been at this meeting before and you were a co-chair in 2015, I believe. Um, speaking about the same kinds of issues and the need for responsible <coughs> business. So this is a message which you're, 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 you're fairly quite clear on. We find ourselves in January 2018 um, listening to the folk like Larry Fink of, of BlackRock calling for a business with a purpose and business needing to change and develop a, a social conscience that goes beyond CSR and, and, and has some kind of real purpose and generates social value. Is that consistent? Um, and is it, are we going to be able to see a business play a, a, a positive role, possibly to see some of the goals that uh, the Cardinal and John have outlined and some of the wrongs that society face? Unsurprisingly, I'm going to argue yes. Um, and actually to uh, the Cardinal's kind invitation uh, for business leaders, I think, to step up and, uh, and take ownership of this, I think that probably the single biggest message I've I will return home with is that business leaders on the whole are stepping up, um, particularly the younger generation. And I think we recognize that we are a part of society and reflecting on the major global challenges today, um, you know, rhetoric is fine, but I think finance will help address some of these solutions. So my great passion is uh, that I do believe finance has a very strong role to play as a force for good in both addressing and solving some of the world's major challenges. You know, and when you, when you reflect on some of the conversations here this week, I mean, let's be very clear, the sustainable development goals that a number of people are hooking their business strategy to, um, are hooking their purpose to, um, on average, we, we reckon that they're going to cost between 50 and 70 trillion um, to actually address those challenges. And when you layer on the Paris Agreement, another 15 trillion, um, you know, these are big fingers. Um, so I think that, you know, there is absolutely a role to play. I think, you know, parts of the world are catching up on this. And um, I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm deeply happy that we have seen such significant growth in sustainably, responsibly managed assets. In fact, they've grown by about 33% um, in aggregate since 2014. And what's interesting about that is that about 96% of these sustainably responsible uh, managed assets are predominantly in North America and Europe. So there is a huge opportunity in the rest of the world to play catch up. Now I find myself working for uh, a Gulf bank and this is a really interesting conversation in terms of how can we play a role in creating a sense of, of leadership and direction, hopefully to try to address some of these big global issues. But the reality is that um, it's very easy to paint business leaders into a corner as, uh, as bad people. Um, I look at, at, you know, this is a vocation as well. And my great concern, if I'm honest, is that a bit like politics, you know, if we vilify business people for, for not doing the right thing when we truly are trying, we just won't end up with good people in business either. And I can't tell you how many conversations I have with the younger generation who just say to me, why would I want to do this? And my, my own view is that, yes, there are certain times and days when I question that myself, but at the end of it, if we don't step up and take an element of leadership in this, then who will follow? So I think that we have an absolute duty to take responsibility, particularly those of us within the business community, 
and really hammer home the message that finance can be a force for good and we absolutely are committed to addressing some of the global challenges. Catherine, thanks. Uh, we're already halfway through, which, which appalls me in certain respects because this could go on for a long time. Uh, we, so we have to be very kind of concise. Um, quick show of hands, please. My boss got his hand up first. He's also my boss, so I'm going to ask, let him ask the first question. Then we'll get the microphone over to the gentleman in the back row and the gentleman in the front row. If there's any, and because of time, can we keep questions focused on this session and the purpose of this session, please? Yeah, it's a very quick question. I mean, this meeting's uh, co-chaired by a Labour leader, Sharon Burrows. Uh, just a question for the panel. How is important is it to get the voice of Labour up there into the international governance system and into international policy discussions? The voice of Labour. Um, can we whiz along the back row to... Jim, why don't you just shout? We can hear you. You've got a good voice. Oh, there you go. Microphone's coming. Lost valuable seconds okay, there. My question is, is to the whole panel, but, but particularly to John. Um, we've been doing pilots on basic income around the world, and it's been shown in all the pilots that we've done that it's a very good way of reducing poverty, increasing economic security, and helping, in particular, women and people with disabilities. What are your views on the possibility of moving in that direction? as a way of, of, of helping to deal with these issues. Basic income, great. Gentlemen in the front row, can you also you remind us where you're from and um, who, you, who you work for or represent? James Burton from The Mail. Um, I have a question for uh, John. Obviously, you are here to point out the issues with global capitalism. Um, you've previously been a sort of f fierce advocate for, for other countries with other systems like Venezuela. Now, in Venezuela, we've obviously seen inflation at 13,000%, child mortality soaring, countries running out of, people running out of medicine and food. I mean, surely does that not show that capitalism is the best solution to the world's problems and that, uh, and, uh, and that you were wrong about <coughs> Venezuela? Okay, so that is alternative models to capitalism. Let's start with international government governance and the importance of having Labour represented on it. John, would you like to start okay, that one? There's been, the last 30 years, it's been interesting that there's been lots of structural changes in government, individual government arrangements for how they engage with people, uh, and also on international bodies as well. And is in, in a number of areas where um, you've, we've found that the structural changes has actually then closed the door to Labour being engaged in, in policy discussions. As a young man, straight out of university, I worked for Trade Union and for the TUC. And it was interesting whether the Conservatives or Labour were in power at that point in time. The TUC General Secretary would have open access to number 10. There'd be dialogue, there'd be structural arrangements, discussions about development skills, etc. For a period of time, that ended. That ended. And I think as a result of that, um, first of all, I think policy making wasn't informed by what's happening on the shop floor. It impacted upon policies around social mobility in, in particular. And in addition to that, I have to say, as we, I think we've all raised it, haven't we, this week as well, you know, the proportion of, of wealth and reward going to shareholders greater now than it is going to labour, the wealth creators, I think is a worrying trend and there will be a backlash against it if we're not. That's why I think this reinforcement of trade union rights is, I think, is absolutely critical, but also an openness by government now to allow the participation in the development of policy and decision making around policy to labour representative organisations is key and that's structurally built into international bodies as well is critical. You just learn the lessons of what's happening on the shop floor and your policies are so much better. What would your eminence's uh, view no, of uh, labour unions be? No, I think, I think uh, probably uh, it requires a suggestion, just maybe, uh, <clears throat> in labour to overcome the contrast and the opposition between labour and investors and not simply talk about shareholders, but begin to talk no more about stakeholders. If we, if we include the stakeholders in the conversation, then those who are interested in any <coughs> industry you know, become more than those who have put money into it, so the shareholders. And as the stakeholders you know, would allow uh, us to consider labor force, the work that they put in, and all of that. So I would, I would suggest that in introducing or considering the voice of uh, labor, we, 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 we understand or we, we accept to refer to them as stakeholders in every business. 
not as opposed to you know, uh, shareholders having a labor force fulfilling their job, but they really are stakeholders in the business. They have stakes in everything that happens. Moving on to the basic income question. Uh, Catherine, as well as being a banker, you're an, you're an economist. Do you have any views on this before we move over to John? No, I'm going to defer to John. <laughs> <laughs> over to John. OK, where we're at, um, Guy Standing asked the question, and Guy's the, well, leading expert on basic income. Where we're at, in terms of the Labour Party, is we're, we're considering it. We've got a working group. Guy and others are participating in that. We'll bring forward reports for consultation. We're encouraging, we're encouraging wherever possible, experiments as well as pilots. We'll be learning from the pilots that have already taken place in Europe. I know in Scotland there's a big interest in launching pilots there. There is a big debate around basic income or basic services. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll encourage that debate. I, for me, and again, I just refer back to Guy. Guy's work is around the precariat. We have a precariat that has grown as a result of, to be frank, real exploitation. You know, those cleaners on two or three jobs, privatisation taking place in our public services, forcing them onto contracts where they have low wages and insecure work. And some of them now, as a result of the fourth industrial revolution, beginning to happen, displacement of people from, from jobs. Having a basic income would give people security, but also even in transitional phases in their life would give them security as well. So I think it is worth examining. We'll bring forward our proposals. Hopefully there'll be more pilots on that. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm deeply interested in the concept. Uh, lastly, alternative models to capitalism, then hopefully we'll have another round of questions. I can see them. Somebody, Mark, uh, Mark can we get a microphone over here? Yeah. John. Oh, uh, I always get thrown this question about Venezuela. Um, to be frank, it's not, that the, um, it's not that the issue is, um, is, is it socialism versus capitalism. In terms of what happened in Venezuela, they took a wrong turn. And they took a wrong turn because all the objectives of Chavez in terms of tackling inequality, investing in education, um, developing people's skills, I think would have been successful if they had actually mobilized the oil resources to actually invest in the long term. And yes, working with private sector as well, invest in the long term. And it's interesting... They should have learnt the lessons of the UK as well, because we squandered our oil resources as well. We allowed private profit to take the benefits of that, rather than as in Norway, where they set up a sovereign wealth fund. So I think, I think in Venezuela they took a wrong turn and not a particularly uh, effective path and not a socialist path. But I say it's uh, the comparison with what happened to the oil revenues of Britain and looking back now about what we could have done with those oil revenues building up a sovereign wealth fund, as Norway did, and that we could invest in our public services. So I think there's lessons to be learned on the mistakes that have been made all round. All right, OK, so let's see some more questions, sir. And then <coughs> um, lady in the back row, and anybody else? And the gentleman in the middle row, that might be enough, might be all of it, please. Uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. A question for John. You said in your introduction that you'd sensed in 24 hours a, a sense of euphoria and even complacency here, the programme has deliberately tried to show, to paint the opposite picture yeah, yeah. to the rest of the world. Do you therefore think that the business people speaking at the World Economic Forum are just doing it for show and giving a sort of show of uh, responsibility to the world where actually they're complacent no, and having parties that, yeah. in the background? I think we'll just, can we just do oh, a couple, couple more questions? And, and again, I don't want this to just be a, uh, you know, Mr. McDonnell here, so please encourage my <laughs> colleagues to, to jump in as well if they have any opinions. Yeah. Lady in the back row. Jenny Not that we Gordon. don't love hearing from you, John. So, Jenny Gordon, um, <laughs> Australia Productivity Commission. Um, I'm just interested in the policy, sorry, in the, the policy options for dealing with the low productivity workers because we know jobs are better than not having a job at all, even given the basic income idea. And so should, do wage subsidies work? Is, and the uh, earned income tax credit, do you think those are a good way of trying to tackle getting those people into the market? So uh, uh, wage, policy options for, for, for wages and gentlemen here in the middle row. Uh, Paulo Como from Nairobi. Uh, two very quick questions uh, to Garrett and maybe to, uh, to John. Uh, for, for the last 45 years, uh, one, of the one of the things that we, people have been struggling with is how to move the Davos man from the mindset of being driven by the shareholder theory. 
And no matter how much you talk about how businesses would want to be good, the bottom line of every conversation has always been the shareholder, the shareholder, the shareholder. Very rarely has it shifted to the larger stakeholder. And, 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 and I don't know whether you see a shift there. But a question to you, uh, to you, uh, to you, John. I know we are talking about free markets here, but uh, just two days ago, we were talking about three markets, and that is the every every business begins with whatever wanting a, a free market, but eventually every every, every business every business wants to become the leading market, and once they become the leading market, they no longer care about free market. If anything, they actually then use their power to now control the rest of, of, of the other actors. And so do you think that probably you are a preacher who maybe needs to fold and go and preach elsewhere? Uh, just on that last note, our, our, our organization, the World Economic Forum, is, forgive me for jumping in, is based on uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, founder mm -hmm. of the chairman's multi-stakeholder theory. So the whole essence, the whole, our very being, is about not about shareholder value, but it's about stakeholder value. So I just want to make that quite clear. Um, I feel that's an important point to make. Um, right, so we have uh, Mr. Giles here, talk is cheap. Why does the program reflect um, uh, the, uh, the alternative to the euphoria you're hearing from the people you're talking to? I think people are well-intentioned. I, I don't deny that. I think sometimes they get swept up in a, almost a collective thought. And the collective thought now is global growth has returned. But they need the salutary lesson about, well, global growth has returned statistically, but where is that growth and where are the benefits of that growth growing? And I think that that's why there needs to be a, a much thorough understanding by politicians and business leaders about just what our people have gone through over the last 10 years and also how they react to that experience. Look at Brexit as a reaction to that. Look at some of the populist politics as well that's taken place across the world. And I, I think there's an avalanche out there of discontent and resentment and alienation if we don't address, address these issues. Uh, I would like to bring you in, Catherine, please. And sorry, we have a little time, so I want to cover as much as possible. But um, again, let's come back to that conversation. Is it, is it a normal year when you have the, the head of a $6 trillion fund talking about the need for purpose-driven capitalism? Or is this genuinely uh, you know, a shifting mindset, which maybe hasn't filtered through to all of the conversation in the, in the Congress Centre? But you've been coming for you know, several years now. Is, uh, are we seeing any kind of change at all? I actually think we are seeing change. Um, I think what's been interesting about this year is, you know, a lot of conversations are happening, you know, around the Congress Centre, perhaps not necessarily in. Um, I've certainly been involved in a number of conversations about purposeful leadership, and I don't think it's just talk. Um, I think, though, there are certain people who probably do hide behind the purpose box, and maybe it is a bit of a marketing gimmick. I think from a very personal perspective, I think you need to be clear about your purpose overall, but from a finance and business perspective, it needs to come with pace. And when you reflect back on the global growth question, perhaps sort of tying it into that, you know, global growth is actually, it's doing okay. Um, but I think there is a divergence, as we've seen. So if growth this year is going to come in at around 3.94%, the fastest growth is going to be in the developing markets. And I think, you know, that is clearly going to be an important trend. That is where we've got some substantive global issues, whether you look at gender equality, whether you look at water scarcity. And I think business leaders to be, need to be very focused on what they're doing to address some of these issues um, as we move forward. But unsurprisingly, you know, I, I really do think there is progress. Um, perhaps you don't see it on every single panel, but I think in quiet conversations there is real resolve uh, particularly from the younger generation, that frankly, we are deeply bothered about the world that our children will face. And it is our responsibility to do something about it. It is no longer good enough to blame it on our fathers and grandfathers. We now have that moment and we want to use it well. Um, do you think uh, emerging markets will leapfrog some of the, you know, the, the evolution of business over here, or do you think they'll take the same trajectory and go through that phase and, and, and take a while to kind of you know, come to this juncture where they understand the need for purpose-driven capitalism? Um, I think that it's an evolution, if I'm honest. Um, but I think, you know, let's not sort of beat around the bush. The session is about free markets. Trade and investment have driven that global growth. Um, you know, in certain parts of the world, the US particularly, you know, 2017 was a lost year for trade policy. You know, every country needs to play a role in this. And I think 2018 is fraught with challenges, whether you look at financial stress, stress, whether you look at geopolitical tensions. But I think each of us sitting on the panel has a resolve to actually do something about it. 
And, you know, I am very confident that we will address some of these issues together. It's across society. It's not one, one segregation, one group can fix everything. John, can we, do you think, get very quick answers to the final two questions? We're talking policy options, and we're talking market power and over, you know, concentration of market power in too few companies. Okay, very quickly, the issue around wage subsidies. Sometimes we've introduced wage sub subsidies just to tackle the problem of people falling into poverty as a result of low wages. The solution is actually have real wages, a real living wage. But it all, that means a, a minimum wage, which is a real living wage, but also to restore trade union rights in, so that we can restore effective free collective bargaining, but also corporate governance reform so there's proper representation of workers and the decisions around remuneration. In that way, we can overcome some of the issues that we're now having to address about um, low wages. With regards to the shareholder, I go with you. And what we want, what we've been advocating for a long period of time is a shareholders are moving into a stakeholder so that everyone has a stake in the company and therefore can share in the profits and share in the benefits of developing that. And I think that's a debate that's inevitably going to come back on, onto the table. In some, in some ways, that's some of the arguments that have been put forward by the Cardinal and the, the Pope themselves. Part of the issue is around free markets as well, just going to it is that we, in many areas, the free markets don't exist. They've actually, what we've seen in some areas, monopolies and cartels being developed. And if you look at what happened in America some time ago about antitrust laws, etc., much of that legislation has been eroded over time, and we need to address that as well. Well, we have to respect schedules, and it's a great sentence I call this uh, session to a close. I hope it's built a picture of how markets are and need to further adjust to make, meet the realities that growth alone cannot address. So thank you all for joining us here today. Yeah. Thank you for joining us in the room and thank you for watching us online. Yeah.